Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Second, good morning, and hopefully this time you can hear me. Uh, my name is Brent Leo Smith. We have Andrew Joseph Francis on camera, uh, Scott Dyson, and Dave on the other other vehicle. And we have Kirsten and Leanne in final control. Unfortunately, there have been a few gremlins early on this morning, and uh, Scott is back at the DRC, and our tech geniuses are trying to figure out what's going on. Oh, excuse me, leopard tortoise, we're in a hurry. We're on a hurry to go see some lions. So they snuck past us as we went up to go check the last position of their kill. And they, uh, looks like they've been robbed by hyenas just from the tracks. And they've now headed off to the closest water, which is the Juma Dam pad. So we are rushing there to go have a look. And as you can see, we're not in our normal vehicle. Right. We are in the, uh, the tracking vehicle. Uh, unfortunately, Jigga has, uh, is awaiting a, a prognosis from the auto doctor uh, who will be in this morning. Hopefully it's nothing too major, uh, but there is a problem with the clutch plate and clutch relay between right. the clutch and the gearbox. I wonder if that hippo is there and will the lions harass him? Let's see. Uh, and a big thanks to all the viewers who let us know that the lions were at Juma Pan. We're nearly there now. And it is a stunning morning. I think it's gonna be another scorcher of a day, but at the moment, the temperature is very pleasant. Oh. It's 26 degrees Celsius, 78 Fahrenheit at 5.30 in the morning. And how's that? So I think today's definitely gonna be a sweltering afternoon. Temperatures getting close to 100 Fahrenheit. As this drought continues uh, to grip South Africa, one of the worst droughts in the last 25 years. Andrew, can you spot the lines yet?
where, oh, where could the kitty cats be? On the move. On the move. Let me get hold of Taxon. Tax, tax. Tax, I'm on the down wall. What's my best approach? I'm King Gums Road. But yeah, they're all going down towards the Dongana. From Katjeho Terry um, on King Gums Road. Copy, thanks. Thanks, tax. Got your visual. So here we go. We're about to arrive. And it sounds like they might head down into the Milwaukee River system. And we might have to shoot around to the other side. Ah, they're going flat cat. How's that, Andrew? A bit more. Okay, we'll try from here, guys. We'll move now if we don't get a good visual. All five ladies present and accounted for. Looks like they had quite a battle with the hyenas last night at the position of that carcass. Hyena tracks everywhere. For those of you who might have tuned in a bit late, we're sitting with the Inkahuma Pride. Uh, all five females present. And they lost their buffalo kill last night from the tracks around the kill. It looks like there was a large group of hyenas that harassed them. And being already quite full before they killed that buffalo, it seems that they possibly might have relinquished it without too much of a fight. So a very good morning to Brenda from Virginia. Uh, Brenda would like to know that the hippo that everyone's seen the lions eating, is that Peter and is that on Juma? It's not, it's on Incoro, it's a different hippo. And uh, I think the lions eating that are the Sticks Pride. And the Birmingham boys. I thought I heard some male lion audio earlier this morning, a little bit south of us, so I'm hoping that maybe the Bir one or two Birminghams have decided to visit us. Thanks, Texas. We're just going to reposition quickly, guys. Minjan. Ok, 
Okay, we're going to get ourselves into a slightly better position than we were earlier. Get you the best possible view of these lions. Maybe not quite the best view just yet. How's that, Andrew? A bit more? No. There's a tree, Andrew. Can't do that, I'm afraid. So Andrew would like me to uh, go into a position. Unfortunately, we can't just yet. We will try maneuver again just now. But Lis Lapa says it's so nice to see the whole pride back together. They seem more relaxed now. You can see those fat, swollen bellies. Now, you wouldn't want to be downwind of these lions today. They're going to be incredibly flatulent after eating all that buffalo. So Donna on Twitter is wondering, is there any sign of a junior, the young male lion that used to be with the pride? So I know a lot of you were very fond of him, but when a male lion gets to three years old, it's time to move on. Uh, I haven't heard of him. He's now a nomadic male. He could even be as far as 100 kilometers from here. There were some reports of a young male lion being seen to the south in Mala Mala, but whether or not it's the same is impossible for us to tell. And Donna and a lot of other viewers were wondering that. We can see a bit of cleaning and preening going on. Even the lions always look so nice and clean and they're very serious about the grooming business. They are completely full of parasites, mites. And even if you have to ever handle a lion for veterinary purposes, it's always a good idea to wear gloves. You don't pick up a nasty liver fluke or three. Derek in New York is wondering why the Birmingham boys, the dominant male coalition, are spending more time uh, to the east and south of us. Well, Derek, it's where they are at the moment is very close to the boundary of the Kruger, and you probably find with the uh, drought conditions at the moment, there's more lions pushing in from the Kruger, and that is making that area probably the most vulnerable in terms of their yeah. territory. So that is why they spend more time down there and roar and roar and roar, trying to make sure none of the males from Kruger decide to move into their territory, their hard fought territory. There we go, Andrew will be much happier with me now that I'm able to reposition. We're the only people left now. So, morning uh, to Peter NG, who asked us some questions on yesterday's sunset safari. Uh, welcome back, Peter. Uh, 
Peter would like to know how many lion prides are in the area. Well, Peter, this is our main pride, the Inkahuma pride. And uh, then the Styx pride come in from the south occasionally. And then we have had the Mangen pride, or the Salala breakaway pride, as well as the original Salala pride. I think that's all the prides of lionesses that we see regularly, but there is a chance we could see the Talamati pride or the Torchwood pride, and those are more to the north and east respectively. And then from male lion coalitions, the two male co lion co dominant male lion coalitions around and about are, oh, excuse me, <laughs> oh, blah, 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 blah. is that the Birmingham boys, which is a coalition of five male lions, and uh, the Salati males, <laughs> excuse me, a bit of dust tickling my nostrils this morning. Now, the Birmingham Boys sounds like a very strange name for a coalition of male lions. And that's, they come from the Timbavati and from the farm that is named Birmingham. You will find a lot of farms in this part of the world when original cartography was being done were named after things that people knew. So you've got lots of Lisbons, Birminghams, Londons. Uh, let's think of another funny one that's out there. Ilkley. So, from the biggest cat to another cat with Scotty D. Can you believe it? It's a cheetah. Finally, a cheetah has returned to the Safari Live cameras. And to be honest, at first I thought it was a leopard. This is awesome. I stopped the vehicle exactly where I saw it. I just saw its little head poking out of that termite mound. What a great start to the morning, lions and cheetah. My name is Scott, and I'm teamed up with Dave on camera. I thought we had found him his first leopard to film, but he's skipped that level and gone straight to cheetah. Can you believe it? Just going to get on the Game Drive channel quickly and let the guys know there's going to be an influx of people racing here. Stations, Look at the beautiful morning sunlight. This is going to be magnificent. Uh oh, don't tell me you're nervous, mister. It could have come in from the Kruger Park. It may not be very used to vehicles. Look at how beautiful this cat is. Yeah, Brett, I'll also come in and join you there. The fastest mammal on Earth is up and moving right in front of us. Its belly looks quite full, and it looks to be a male. I wouldn't say it's a very old male, but my experience with cheetah is fairly limited, especially compared to that of lion and leopard. I've never worked in areas where cheetah have been hugely abundant, and that's why we are so fortunate this morning. It's not a common big cat to see in the Sabi Sands. Fantastic. Okay, so, I'm gonna get back on the radio and try and keep up with, with him. Looks like it could be a little bit nervous, so maybe we can keep it to a two vehicle sighting. This for the first part is up and mobile now towards quarantine. and just making sure we don't take any chances here and chase them off because when the fastest mammal on earth wants to move they can obviously disappear quite easily so maybe it was just default that he got up and started moving as we got a bit closer but he did seem a little bit nervous of the vehicle yeah all good there dave no 
Now, because it barely seems quite full, it may not be hugely inclined to uh, to do any hunting, but you never know. These big cats are opportunistic, and it's heading straight towards a big open clearing. And being an incredibly fast animal, it tends to prefer hunting in open spaces. And who knows, maybe we are going to get incredibly lucky. And even if we don't see it catch and pull, maybe we're just going to be able to see it moving at full speed. Look at this. Fantastic. So, like I said, you can see its belly is a little bit protruding there. Look at all that hair dangling off the bottle, bottom. That, to me, indicates that it's a slightly younger male. But then again, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> a combination of size and all of that loose hair indicates to me that he could be, like I say, on the younger side. Midway between quarantine and Zoe's, just a little bit west of that road that runs through the middle. Well, this is more. I thought it was a good sign as he lay down there, but I'm probably just gonna have to keep my distance. I'm learning his parameters and boundaries, and I just need to keep into consideration the last two times that I've approached. I've kept track of those distances and now I'll be able to give him just a few more meters and then hopefully next time he lies down we should be okay. I often wonder how many times Cheetah had actually been through the property without us finding him and I think quite a number of times. But who knows exactly how many times we've been missing them. What I can assure you is it's not like we often find their tracks or see their tracks um, that we can then follow and then not find anything. It's just simply no major sign. Andrew, confirm you're looking to join the sighting. Um, yeah, I got him. Uh, thanks so much. Okay, for me. Just going to try and stop as much as possible and let David film him moving off where possible, but that was a, not a good spot to do it in. Sorry, Dave. Um, See, it's very difficult for for David to film as both us and him are moving. Affirmative, he's going to pop out on the northwestern edge of quarantine. Tex, as long as you stay about 50 meters away, he's, he's fine. But anything closer than that, he's not happy. Okay, apologies that I have been neglecting you guys a little bit as we drive through here, but it's hugely important that we give Taxon and Aubrey as much clues as possible trying to get a glimpse of this rare animal with their guests. Oof, he's heading into a tricky area. And again, because I'm going to try and keep our distance from him, it's going to be incredibly difficult staying with him. So let's hope that we get some more views, but again, I don't want to out of our way to ruin this animal today in order just to get a few more views after having such great views of him already. I don't, I don't know when we are going to get the next view of him, so I'm inclined to send you back to the lions with Brent, and we'll call you if we get another glimpse. How awesome was that? Wish us luck, and we'll see you later.
So isn't that exciting, guys? All right, Scotty's found that cheetah, and we're sitting with lions. So what a great start to the sunrise safari. And, well, as you can see, lions doing what lions do best. Still sleeping. Heavy breathing still. Nice full bellies. So Cheryl in Indiana is wondering about how a lioness gives birth. Do they stay with the bride or do they move off on their own? Well Cheryl, they do move off on their own. Now have a nice secure den site. Uh, where they'll give birth and we'll keep the cubs separate from the pride for the first month or two uh, before introducing them into the pride. Matt O'Wix is wondering why do the lionesses do all the hunting when the males are bigger and stronger? Now, Matt, that's a very, very common misconception, which is not true. Male lions do a lot of their own hunting. They spend a lot of time away from the female primes, defending territory, marking territory. So they do a lot of their own hunting. It's only if they happen to be in the same area as the lionesses and they make a kill that they will take it from them being bigger and stronger. Uh, it's sort of their prerogative. And males are generally better at catching bigger animals, uh, hippo, buffalo, even young elephants in some cases, but not really here. See, they're looking very contented. Nice, cool morning. Well, cool's a relative thing out here. It's 26 degrees Celsius this morning. 76 odd Fahrenheit. That's how we start the morning out here. We thought it was quite cool. Andrew's still in jerseys. A very warm safari live welcome to Kathy in Tennessee. Kathy would like to know, do all lions have black marks on the back of their ears and does it serve a purpose? They do, Kathy. Also the black tip to the tail and it's a following mechanism uh, for youngsters and for others to follow each other through thick bush or long grass. Uh, black and white, the two colors that stick out most prominently and for big cats and the way their eyes work and also I th in my opinion they're used to portray visual signals while they're hunting to help coordinate a hunt so very important there's black tip to the tail and the black marks behind the ears There we go, we can see that black a fluffy tip to the tail, which is the opposite to the leopard. Uh, the leopard has a white fluffy tip, also for the same reasons.
Romy in Ohio is wondering what would happen if the lions and cheetahs would happen to meet. Um, if the cheetah spots the lions, it will try to get out of there as fast as possible. If the cheetah spots the lions too late, the lions will definitely try to kill it. And there's no match between a lion and a cheetah. Uh, a lion is massively bigger, massively much or more, much more strong, and the cheetah has to rely on its speed to get away. She heard something. Does look like she's heard something. Did he pop up? Popped her head up and listening to the ears. And you can see her ears doing the little scans. I wonder what she heard. Oh, nothing too serious. It's possible she might have heard another animal, a nyala, or anything moving around in the bush off to the north of us, but not looking too perturbed by it. Sandra from Southern Sunny, California uh, says, Brent, I love your folklore stories. And uh, maybe you can tell us another one about lions soon. And also, do I think any of these individuals might be pregnant? Um, I don't, Sandra. I think it's going to be a while before we see cubs out of this pride with the whole coalition takeover that's just happened. Uh, what lionesses will do is often the first and maybe even the second bout of mating, they come into a false estrus. And so the male, males think they might sire cubs, but they don't. And the reason for this is the females don't want to expend the energy of raising cubs, producing milk, uh, in case those males get ousted. Oh, looks like a little bit of movement, maybe just moving deeper into the shade. And you'll often find lion prides lying very close together, which looks like it's going to happen here. So these moments like this are very important to, for the bonds between the prides, because when they're feeding, they tend to forget that everyone's friends, and they can be quite aggressive with each other. So in the moments that they're not feeding, they tend to be very loving and affectionate to reaffirm those bonds that could have taken a bit of a beating during beating each other up over food. So Casey is wondering, will lions let the ox peckers can't remove ticks from them. Most certainly not, being a cat, I think the, the, the temptation of eating the ox pecker would be too great. So you don't find ox peckers on any of the predators. How they try to deal with ticks is through grooming themselves and grooming each other. And quite often we might see little blood spots, especially on the neck, and that's when a lion often scratches and pops the ticks that are on it. There we go last female going to join the others. And the flop is coming. It's really funny when they occasionally flop on each other. But I think they're just moving into the shade as the sun starts creeping through the trees. 
Uh, I don't think these lions are going to be doing too much more. We'll stay here for a few more minutes. Donna would like to know, do lions get skin diseases? They do. And the, probably the most common is sarcoptic mange. And they can pick that up relatively easy. But we haven't seen much mange in this area. I have seen lion and leopard with mange in the Sabi Sands before though, but quite a long time ago. So before we leave and on request we will tell a little folklore story about why the lion doesn't eat fruit. And it's a Mbogush story from the river bushmen of northern Botswana that live around the Okavango Delta. So one day the crafty blackback jackal happened to find a huge amount of fruit under a monkey orange tree and it was perfectly ripe and he was eating, eating, eating as only a jackal can, thinking this is so lucky, there's no one else and I'm getting all this wonderful food. And then the king of the beasts meandered past and jackal heard him calling sorry, earlier and said, oh, I hope he doesn't come here, he might get my fruit. And then he did happen to wander there and a jackal, being one of the most crafty creatures in the bush, went, ah, I know how to fix this lion. So he saw the lion coming and he started eating faster and faster and faster and then started wailing and wailing and gnashing his teeth and rolling around. And the lion got a bit, of a bit of a shock and just carried on moving. And Jackal knew where there was a skeleton of another jackal. So he went and placed it around the fruit and positioned it like the vultures had been feeding on it and spread, spread his bones. And lion, a few weeks later, was walking past, saw all this delicious fruit under the tree, walked there, saw Jackal's skeleton and saw, decided that that fruit must be poisonous. And that was the day that Lion vowed never to ever eat any fruit, which obviously Jackal and the other animals were quite thankful of because the king of the beasts has a mighty appetite. So I think on that note, we're going to leave these sleeping, sleepy lions and go see what else we can find. And while we do that, let's go catch an update with Scotty D. Well, you left us at a good time because we have not had not even a glimpse of that cheetah since he left us and he headed into the thick bush over to our right. There's a little riverbed within this little uh, dip and he could of course pop out at any stage. Aubrey and Texan are still in the area trying to find him. But because we decided to give him the space that he kind of needed, it was a gamble, uh, a huge gamble. It didn't work out this time for us, but I think it worked out better for the cheetah. You saw a couple of times he was a little bit nervous, and of course we don't want to be chasing cheetah around all day. We want to be following them as they do their business unperturbed. So I'm guessing he may well have come in from the Kruger National Park or the Manuleti Reserve to the north of us animals are not exposed to as many vehicles as they are here or let me rephrase that they may not be exposed to vehicles who are trained and experienced when it comes to animals and their behavior um, just taking a termite mound back there just to make sure i couldn't see his head poking out of it again so because they aren't experienced with as many vehicles or with vehicles that give them the respect that they need, they are not as comfortable with them as the, the animals within the Saudi sands. Viewing a flying up to the same position. Three. Okay, I think we need to turn around though now. I think his direction of movement is taking him more south and west and at the moment we're pointing kind of directly west and we're going to head back in a south and easterly direction and maybe we'll be able to intercept him Come 
on the cheetah. Who knows, maybe we're gonna find him and he may have linked up with a brother or another young male. It's not uncommon for cheetah to form coalitions, just like the Birmingham males did. Probably brothers and cousins. Cheetah will also do the same thing. So it's almost a little bit of a surprise seeing a youngish male like he appeared to be all on his own. But again, there's no fixed rules in the cheetah kingdom with regards to where the males will operate individually or within coalition. Sometimes three or four males will band up together. bang bang and you're right it is in fact David's first cheetah as it is a lot of your first cheetahs and just as we we're heading out I said we need to find him his first leopard for the morning and when I first spotted that cheetah I thought it was a leopard because all I could see were its little ears and a half of its head poking out of the top of a termite mound and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang suggests that we could possibly nickname David the Cheetah or maybe the, skunk, uh, the Shangan word Shkankan, which is also interestingly enough used for a term to call a, a pretty lady. So it can be confusing when you're driving around and another guy says, hey, you've got some mushle shkankanks on your vehicle. It means you've got some nice ladies on your vehicle. But you can hear that same term being called in over the radio, and it means a very different thing. So I don't want to put David in that bracket where he could either be cheetah or a pretty lady. So we'll have to debate that back at camp over breakfast, but it is certainly a worthwhile suggestion. So thank you for that. We've only got one wild animal in our team at the moment, and that is the wildebeest, aka Vim. Hi there, Chris in Arizona. Got some friends in this vehicle up ahead of us. Um, so it'll be nice to catch up with them. Um, and they did also get a glimpse of the cheetah. Chris in Arizona, I will be with you shortly. I don't know what cheetah means. And what I do know is that this cheetah doesn't have a name. None of the, the cheetah in this area of the Sabi Sands have got names that I'm aware of because we don't see them frequently enough to warrant naming. Morning. How are you guys doing? Very good. The cheetah has disappeared. Yeah, must be still in the floor. Do you think so? Yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh. Are you going to do Philemon's cut line or are you going to do Rebecca's? Yeah, Rebecca. Perfect. I'll do Philemon's cut line in case. Cool, guys. Good luck. Did you get a glimpse at least? Yeah. Wonderful. All right. See you later. Bye. So, they've been back to Juma, I think, three or four times in the pair that I've been and it's mainly two guys that keep introducing new friends to the experience. And we've just seen a Texan going down Philemon's cut line there, so we'll leave him to it, and we will go back and check Philemon's dip again. And who knows, we could get lucky. So Chris, I don't know what cheetah means or where the word is derived from. Um, good question. And like I said, the, the, the cheetah in various parts uh, of Africa and various reserves will get names, um, just like leopard and lion sometimes do get names. But because we see cheetahs so infrequently, I've never heard any of the guys, even in the surrounding camps where we may not traverse, but we can hear what they're doing over the radio, they only ever call in cheetah as cheetah. They haven't seen any frequently enough to warrant naming them. And then I guess that, that's the only time when it's useful to, to give them a name is when you can actually follow them closely enough to know that this is one individual as opposed to another. It's not to be able to greet them. Morning, John. I was your pile of hunt this morning. It's just so that we can keep track of who's who. We do have 
have at least Aubrey and Texan with their trackers. So their trackers are also going to be scanning the roads for the very telltale track of a cheetah. I hope we can find you one. And it's almost actually worth us going back to where we first spotted them so I can show you a track. So let's do that. If we don't have any luck immediately over here, in that last area where he was left, we'll go back and see if we can't find you a cheetah track where you crossed across two roads so there's there's a chance we could get lucky hello Liz Lapa and you say you're surprised that they are not uh, cheetah here because you see so many impala here juma well i'm not sure where you're seeing all the impala i haven't seen one this morning um and i'm not sure what you're basing your your comparison on because there's obviously huge portions of the kruger national park huge that we don't see and i'm guessing you may not have seen and there may well be a lot more impala and open terrain more suited to cheetah there and that's basically why they are there and, and not here that coupled with the fact that there are huge amounts of lion and leopard here, which kill cheetah at any given opportunity. So that explains that. I hear you though, I mean it's not for a lack of abundant prey, it's more for me the fact that there are lion and leopard here. But we also need to be hugely careful making assumptions that Juma is Africa, because it certainly isn't. It's a very tiny pinprick of Africa and of the Kruger National Park. So even very nearby us, we get hugely different terrain, even within the Sabi Sands. And to give you guys some, some perspective here, in terms of the size of the Kruger National Park, the Sabi Sands is 60,000 hectares. Within that 60,000 hectares, there are probably thousands upon thousands of miles of road networks. I'm saying thousands. There are roads everywhere in a relatively small wilderness area. 60,000 hectares, many camps, lots of people driving around. So we know this area very well, and that's great because we get to keep track of the animals, people get to see them. But there are blocks in the Kruger Park that are even larger than the entire Sabi Sands with not one single road going through them. So um, I, I hope that helps understand or helps to, to, to kind of give you a ratio of the size of this place. It is ginormous that we're a part of and the cheetah have many, many options in terms of where they can live. And there's good reason for it. Thank you very much, Mary Ann, in Texas, for teaching me my second Hindi word. And that is where the word cheetah is derived from, and it means spotted animal, I'm told. So thank you very much for that. Another interesting Hindi word that has an impact on Africa is that of the bull elephants in their sexually heightened stage called must. Not musk with a K, musk with a S. TH and that means mischievous in India and I obviously derived that from the, the Indian elephants which do act mischievously when their testosterone is flowing. There's a few tree squirrels just sitting in this tree over here out there playing around in the morning sun and they are such good sentinels for spotting predators that maybe it will pay for us to wait here for a second or two. We'll leave them to it. Joel in New York, good morning. Cheetah versus leopard, who would have the upper hand? Obviously, depending on a few variables, i.e. male leopard versus female cheetah, male cheetah versus female leopard, um, there's going to be variations. But in general rule, as a general rule, leopards are going to be 
extremely dominant over Cheetah. Cheetah, as you saw, that they're built for speed, for confrontation. They don't have the same robust build of a leopard, which is more similar to that of a lion, just smaller. The cheetah's build is completely different to that of a lion or a leopard. It's not nearly as bulky and as powerful. It's not built for rough and tumble as are leopard's bodies. Even taking down prey for a leopard, I mean, it's generally a far more dangerous and physical affair uh, in terms of kind of wrestling match, you could say, compared to that of cheetah, who will chase their prey far further in general than a, than a leopard would. And therefore, when, when, they when they've caught up to their prey or managed to catch them, you often find that the, the prey is so exhausted from running that it doesn't take too long and it's not hugely difficult as a general rule, again, for the cheetah to kill them. Whereas for the leopards, they ambush predator, they may only move a meter or two before landing on their prey, full of energy, kicking, writhing around. So. It's not uncommon even to see leopards kill cheetah and then dangle them in a tree next to the kill of the cheetah. Usually the cheetah make the kill, the leopard watches from a distance and then sneaks in and while the cheetah's feeding it gets killed and goes up the tree and then it takes the impala that the cheetah killed up the tree and either feeds on both or one of them but that is the, the reality. I've never actually seen that, I've only seen photographs of that. Some of you may remember, I think with Brent, not so long ago, Quarantine or Kunuma chased not one, but I think two cheats around. Okay, bravos. You interested to know? about you know cheetah sightings that I have had in the past again like I said earlier not many um, although I did manage to see two kills here in the Sabi Sands the southern Sabi Sands um, where the property that I was working on did have a few open areas and there was one male cheetah that we saw fairly regularly enough to name him he was called the 40k pan male and uh, We'd see him in fre fairly infrequently, and I did manage to see him hunting twice, which was absolutely awesome. I mean, their speed is horrifying. The first time he actually made a kill, he started chasing the Impala from probably here to this marula tree uh, right in front of us, and that's probably 50 or 60 meters away. I mean, it's a massive gap. Impala would look at leopard and chuckle at this distance, and lion, and not even think about moving, it's not an issue. But with the cheetah, he started trotting from about here, and then I'll simulate what actually happened. And then the, 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 the Impala started running, and I thought, well, the, the cheetah's got no chance. And I promise you, he just tore after them. It looked like they had fridges strapped to their backs. And he disappeared slightly over a little ridge. And it was mainly flat, but there was a slight ridge, and we were obviously battling to keep up with the fastest mammal on Earth, as it all took me by surprise, and to be honest, I thought he didn't have a chance. And as we came over the rise, we just saw a cloud of dust as he took the impala down, and the rest was history. But what I learned there is that they have got phenomenal speed. To reel in a herd of impala from that kind of a head start is testament to that. Um, another kill, which is also interesting to describe their hunting, that I saw was in slightly thicker vegetation with actually quite a few little rocky boulders in and amongst it. So it was a bit of an obstacle course for the cheetah. And what this did is it, it, it gave the impala obstacles to work off, you could say, and sidestep and disappear behind a bush. You know, it's not like being stuck in a large open clearing, which was the case for the first unlucky impala. And... Darted around and you'd get close, close, close to the, the, the cheetah, uh, the impala, sorry, and then they would sidestep and then you'd have to catch up to them again, and then they would sidestep. So the sidestep of the antelope does put them in good stead and often is what throws the cheetah. Um, but eventually he did manage to catch up after kind of three or four laps around this little circuit. And that was also interesting to see that they can hunt in thick bush. We saw 
Again, some of you will remember a Chitza finishing off a Diker kill across on Arathusa close to the airstrip, and he caught that Diker in fairly thick bush. So even though they prefer to operate in less thick vegetation, they can, when need be, operate even in the thickest of bushes. So they're adaptable, like I guess most of the African animals. This is where we, it all started, at that termite mound at about one o'clock over there. Saw his head poking out, his body was on them, but mainly on the other side there. Now I am going to check very carefully for where his tracks cross the road. Diana, you would like to know what is the main prey of the cheetah. Thank you for asking, because I haven't touched on that. Um, it's smaller prey in general, so up to impala sized prey is a regular kind of sized meal for a cheetah, and smaller than that. So Impala Dyker Steenbuck are the main prey species in this area, but having said that, I have seen the bigger che uh, male cheetah take down adult female kudu, they can take down wildebeest, so they can be highly effective at taking down larger prey, and also those coalitions of males can also be very good. I'm just going to hop out quickly and see if I can work out where these tracks are before I drive on it in a second. So the thermite mound was right there, and he basically walked straight across. Now, obviously, depending on where he put his feet will depend on whether or not they're in a good spot for us to see them. Feeling the pressure. Listen carefully, you might be able to hear a hyena. I wasn't expecting to come out with a complete blank there, but I did. Hmm. Also had some elephants breaking branches up ahead of us. Now this certainly wasn't the case this morning, so I cannot use this excuse. Oh, we're going to rush you over to Brent. He's got a little baby. So we found this little female diker sleeping at the base of a peltiforum or weeping bottle. Normally, we normally see the rear end of a diker as it disappears running from us. But this little female is just snoozing. Looks quite comfortable. So this is how dikers spend their nights normally and curled up sleeping at the base of a bush. They do forage quite a bit at night as well, but they will sleep. This one looks like it's been having a little late lion this morning. I just see your ears moving ever so slightly every now and then in your eyes. Occasionally blinking.
Very sweet. Okay, so we're gonna leave this little die to sleep on and continue on our search for wonderful creatures of the African bush. And while we do that, Logan and Charlotte, uh, who are have, watching Safari Live as their homeschool science lesson, uh, would like to know are there any animals that hibernate during winter or during the drought? And they are. Uh, none of our mammals will really hibernate, but the reptiles do. Uh, during the winter months, a few snake species will uh, hibernate for the cold months and uh, the tortoises as well will also hibernate for the cold months. But one of the more interesting ones that really only hibernates during a drought and only in extreme droughts and extreme conditions is the crocodile. Not true hibernation, it sort of slows down its metabo t met metabolic rate. Uh, when water dries up, it'll find a cave uh, in the bank of a river or even sometimes far from a river in Botswana when the Savuti dried up. The crocodiles there used to move into the hills and into these caves and stay there till the rainy season and then move down into the pads. And actually, they became quite vulnerable, those crocodiles, and some of the leopards in that area actually specialized in taking crocodiles out of these caves. So really, really interesting. So Logan and Charlotte, hopefully that uh, helps you with that answer. So we're gonna see if we can really knock the big cats out of the park this morning. And I'm on the search for fresh leopard tracks. So far, quite a few elephant tracks around here, but no sign of kitty cat tracks just yet. Jenny in Texas is uh, asking, would I ever consider writing a book of all my adventures? Uh, definitely one day, Jenny. I think I've still got a few more adventures to add uh, before we're quite ready to put it down to paper or to digital format these days. So while we continue looking for leopard tracks, uh, let's go look at the cheetah tracks with Scotty. Okay, everyone. So we found the cheetah track. You can see it on the top left of your frame there. And I'm going to just jump out quickly so I might get in the way. Sure, I'm so relieved that we managed to at least find one track for you. And here it is. Okay, now what we need to look at is the very small back pad. On top of that, it's got three lobes like a regular cat, but this to me looks more like a stealth bomber airplane. It's far more narrow and neat and precise than that of a lion or a leopard. Sorry, my drawing there was terrible if you managed to see it. If you didn't, that was probably a blessing, but it, uh, judging by Dave's smile, I think you did. So very neat and precise small back pad. And then the toes, more similar to a hyena or a dog than that of a lion or a leopard. And you can even see from there, and I know you can, the tiny little depressions, let me get the sun on the right side here, from where the claws have kicked up. And cheetah, unlike lion and leopard, their claws will be continuously protruded and can extend a little bit further than that kind of regular protrusion but they are not sheathed fully like lion or leopard. So there we go, there's a singular cheetah track. 
and I'm glad we got to show you one, possibly the first cheetah track that a lot of you have seen, and in quite good substrate, so it's a very good indicator of how their tracks do tend to look. Wonderful stuff. Well, panicking there, but we weren't going to find it. Luckily, we had actually parked just beyond the track, but by the time we came back, I had not driven over it, thankfully. Good. I'm going to do one more loop through the general area of where that cheetah was lurking, and who knows, maybe we will get lucky. Failing that, we're going to return to plan A, which was very rudely and abruptly interrupted by that cheetah, and that is to go and find Shadow, a female leopard. And imagine if we get, Dave, a combo deal of both cheetah and leopard first time filming here on Safari Live. It's a possibility. And that'll be wonderful for Dave. What will be wonderful for you is that you've seen all three of the big cats. So yeah, no problem. So it's hard to decipher what's going on this Game Drive channel a lot of the time. So it's just important that I make sure I don't miss anything. All right, so for those of you who may have just joined us, the cheetah was moving. Thankfully, Brent was managed to decipher their last radio communications, and he suggested that we rush over towards Sydney's dam. There's a pack of wild dog that could well come onto Juma. They're not on Juma now. So let's just rush over and see what happens. Again, we're going to have to put the leopard on hold. This is okay, ridiculous. Okay, come join you in that area. All these other endangered predators getting in our way. Yeah, you can come up for join people there, and then uh, you, when you're done, you will give us a space. We, we've got it camp, so I won't come up there. Racing past a herd of elephants here. Sorry, Ellie's wild dogs out trump elephant this morning, but they are there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I find strange is that if Brent's sending me into an area of wild dogs ahead of him, there's probably a slim chance of them being there. Otherwise, he would get himself into that position. So, <laughs> and now I'm hearing the radio. I think there was a tiny zebra on the road ahead of us. Well, that'll make sense because here come the rest. Because it sounds like these wild dogs are a little bit further north than expected, not very close to our boundary, but that's not a problem. It also sounds like they're about to eat something, a considerable portion away from our boundary, which would slow them down, understandably. There you go, the zebra. There's one more he's going to come through. Well, aren't we getting spoiled? There's just animals around every corner this morning. Sunshine Jenkins, and I've been waiting for somebody to ask this. So I'm glad that you did. 
What is the difference between a cheetah and a leopard? Well, first I'm just gonna, let me actually just get my book out and do it properly from the get-go. There's a few telltale differences. One we have discussed, and I'll discuss one more time to start off, and that is that their, 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 their build is that of a supermodel, not of a cage fighter. So they've got slender physiques, unlike the robust physique of their other big cat friends, the lion and the leopard. Now, just seeing leopard tracks here, but I think they are from Shadow from last night. Uh, not Shadow, Karuna from last night. Uh, the night before last. They're just on our right here going down the road, but I can tell from their crispness all over here, heading down the road there. I can tell from their crispness that they are the tracks of Karula last night that headed straight past the Juma waterhole. And interestingly, we find Shadow's tracks just a little bit further up ahead on the road here. So they came close to one another. Maybe, who knows, they may have even seen one another, heard one another. And the, the interesting thing is that now there's more tracks going back up here that look fresher. And there they go. Perfect. Straight up there, there's one, there's another, there's the next. So there are other tracks that do look quite fresh. And the interesting thing, and I'm going to just get out here and take a closer look to make sure I know exactly what's going on, is that there is a chance that Shadow does have cubs. There's also a chance that Karuna does still have cubs. But we are not too sure. And that's why I just want to check this area. Any one of these, those two leopards could be using this general area as a possible den site. It's unlikely because it is on the fringe of their territories. It's still just worthwhile to investigate. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize in advance as I concentrate on trying to work out what's going on here. I'm just going to go into the other side of the vehicle. Um, there's a prominent game trail here, or pathway here, that you can see. Very prominent path. And along this, one of the leopards walk, but you can see there's a lot of elephant tracks here. And the fact that these elephant tracks are here, they're going down in that direction. The fact that these elephant tracks have trampled the leopard tracks, which only starts over here coming off this path, indicates that these tracks are obviously all probably old. And I'm guessing this is where Shadow and Karula actually met up last night, had a hissing match, a snarling match, and then both went their separate ways. And we, we're certain of that because one set of tracks went south and one set of tracks went north. But I think this is where they actually possibly interacted or possibly they just heard one another or smelt one another's scents slightly after one another. But they were both in this area, not last night, the night before. There we go. Interesting stuff. So even though we are on a wild dog hunt in this area, we could bump into Shadow or Karula here. So not a complete deviation from our plans. Got confused. There were a few very crisp tracks in the fine drought, drought stricken dust that hold their clarity and hold their sharpness that can look like a very fresh track. So, confusing business this tracking. Wonderful morning, it is heating up. Every minute that ticks along, how we're we looking uh, halfway. And I think we are in for a, it's another oven-like day here. It is very toasty here at the moment. Apologies. 
apologies for not finishing off the previous question after being distracted by those leopard tracks. As I said, I was going to bring out my book and Sunshine Jenkins. We will now be able to show you the differences between the leopard and the cheetah. I know they are one page apart. There you go. Perfect. Okay, so if we look at the top picture here, let me try and get out the glare. That seems a little bit better. Um, complete black spots, solid black spots throughout its body. You do get solid black spots on leopard, but it's mainly rosettes. And I'm just going to turn over and you'll see this. You'll see that the solid black spots are mainly on the limbs. And thereafter, you get, I guess there are tiny solid black spots, but they create a rosette with a caramel center. So, hugely different coat pattern. Now look at the leopard. From his eye, along the side of his muzzle, there's no distinctive tear mark. Whereas with the cheetah, there's probably more evidence in this picture of a king cheetah here, the bottom one. Sorry, Dave. You can see this black tear mark that runs down from the eye along the side of the muzzle. So that's one. Then if we go straight back up to the top cheetah, the tails are very large and a combination, I guess, of fur and obviously some meat. And these tails act like rudders to steer them at speeds of up to 60 miles an hour and slightly in excess thereof. So there are the main visual differences, the tear marks and the spots versus the rosettes. Also, the slender physique, small head, big tail, as opposed to the leopard, which is a more bulky animal. Are you guys coming from Difficult to tell. I forgot that there's this picture, <laughs> which shows you the difference between a spotted coat of a cheetah over here, or the rosetted patterns uh, of I... the leopard. Very good. Uh, another interesting fact about cheetah is that they will hunt mainly during the day. They're not really active at night, like lion and leopard are. And they can hunt at night, especially in full moon. <coughs> but also, don't be fooled by that, but as a general rule, they're not going to be hunting at night time. They're a daytime hunter. And Bree and I has just asked another question re relating to their hunting and the way they acquire their food. And they'd like to know if they will ever scavenge or steal food from other animals. Um, no, it's highly unlikely, unless a caracal or a serval's made a kill that the cheetah wants to steal, there's nothing that they can really overpower. Lion, leopard, and what's the other one I'm looking for? Lion, leopard, and hyena, and even wild dog will all hugely outcompete cheetah. They are at the bottom of the food chain regarding the bigger of the predators here. Interesting things happen in nature. I'll never forget a sighting. It was an awesome afternoon spent with the 40k pan male, who's probably long gone now, um, about four or five years ago when I was in the southern Sahari sands. And let's just stop and watch these two birds as I tell you the story, silhouetted. Oh, well, there goes one. We may still get. We may get the next one. I'm just going to continue because I can hear a game drive work and it sounds like they're having the greatest of mornings, singing and being very jovial. Sorry there, Dave. Um, so it's not going to be a picturesque scene for us with them shouting and screaming in the background. At first I thought it was the wild dogs tearing apart an animal, but it turned out to just be some humanoids. Um, and as I was saying, um, as I was saying, sorry, the cheetah hyena story that I was going to tell you is that basically we spent the afternoon with a, a, a big male cheetah in a very open clearing. 
and short green grass. It wasn't a drought summer, it was a rainy summer. And we followed it, probably move two or 300 meters on two or three different intervals. You'd lie down on one spot, move a quarter of a mile, lie down again, move a quarter of a mile, but in a big, big open clearing where we could literally see the whole area that we had followed him through. And we saw a hyena approaching from way in the distance. And it walked across the trail that the cheetah took from its kind of first point that it got up and moved when we were with it. And as soon as that hyena hit the path, the pathway of that cheetah walking through open green grass, not an actual pathway, just the path that the cheetah took, the hyena stopped, sniffed the air, and got onto the trail of that cheetah and literally followed it step for step, all the way around to the first stop where the cheetah lay, the hyena sniffed around there, then it moved to the next spot where the cheetah lay, and then it eventually approached the cheetah that was lying, you know, next to the vehicle, no kill, no nothing. And I told all the guests what's going to happen is as soon as that the hyena gets close by, the cheetah's probably going to run off. Um, it's not going to risk confrontation. We're not going to expect too much here because there's nothing for, you know, there's nothing at stake. There's no meal. And a hyena is not going to go out of its way to kill a, a cheetah, kind of like a lion or a leopard would, uh, for competition. It's just going to come and have a look if there's a meal. If not, it's going to just leave. If there's a meal, meal of course, it's going to confront the cheetah, chase it off and steal it. But what happened was, is that it was quite the opposite. The hyena arrived and did a circle around the cheetah. And as it came to about 360 degrees, as it about, about, was about to complete the circle, just making sure there wasn't an easy meal, this cheetah came out at the hyena and actually walloped it on the bottom. So even though I would have put huge money against that, and I told all of my guests that obviously the cheetah is going to give weight to the hyena, it's more frail, it's not confrontational. On that day, that male cheetah took on the hyena and showed it a lesson. I've got a photograph of it somewhere, I must find it of the cheetah delivering a blow to the hyena of the hyena of his back legs disappearing below its bottom. Okay. okay. We are going to send you across to Brent's. Um, I don't think the wild dogs have come any closer. Um, but we are going to keep lurking around this general area just to make sure they don't come to Sydney's waterhole, which may be a good uh, source for them to wet their throats after their kill. Over to Brands. So, isn't that exciting? A possible another predator might appear. So, Scotty was close up to Sydney, so he's gone and he's going to stand by there. Uh, Andrew and I decided to have a, a little squiz around the area where the cheetah disappeared very quietly and slowly. Now, talking about cheetah and wild dog. Oh, there's a lilac breasted roller quite close to us. I'm just going to stop. Have a look at this beautiful bird. And who knows how many different colors there are on a lilac breasted roller. If you know how many colours there are, let me know. Drop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv. Oh, off it goes. Or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So, we've been doing quite a few little African folklores at the moment. And uh, while we're talking about wild dog and cheetah, it reminds me of a really good one. It's a Bushman story, or a sand story how a cheetah got its speed. So the creator was very proud with the job it did with all the animals, so decided to organize a race to see who was the fastest animal of, in creation. And he decided that the two that were up there was the sesame, which is the fastest antelope species, and one of the fastest antelope, if not the fastest, oh, squirrel crossing and a little squirrel and decided to cross a huge valley from the big baobab tree to the hill on the other side and early in the morning they got ready and they set off at speed but the sesame was so much faster it 
quickly built up a strong lead over the cheetah and it was disappearing at a rate of knots when tragedy struck. The sesame stepped in an art fark hole and hurt its leg. Now cheetah being such a kind and living, giving soul, instead of running on to win the race, oh I forgot the most important part of the story. Uh, in those days cheetah had really soft what do you see, Andrew? A monkey. Where is it? Oh, you better be careful, Andrew. Um, Cheetah had really soft paws, and for the race, he borrowed wild dogs' hardened paws with the claws to be able to keep up the speed for long distances. Ah, there, now I see it. Um, but even with that, yeah. I'm just going to have to try and move, sorry guys. Um, even with that, uh, the sesame was beating him thoroughly before he fell in the hole and hurt his leg. But because the cheetah stopped, where's this little creature gone? Right there. Because he, he stopped to help, uh, the creator decided that because cheetah was such a good sport, he would make cheetah the fastest animal as well as letting cheetah keep wild dogs paws and that's why a cheetah is the only cat that has got claws that are visible in its tracks. There you go, a little vervet monkey. And seems to be eating the bark of this marula, probably to try to get moisture. Where the rest of the troop are. Well, troop is a more commonly used collective noun for monkeys, but I wonder who knows the original colonial English collective noun for monkeys. If you do know that answer, send it in to me. Questions at wilder.tv or hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. What is the original colonial collective noun for monkeys? And well done to Barbara and Safari Dean who have got it correct. There are seven different colors on a lilac breasted roller. Very busy little chap. I can't see any others around. That doesn't mean they're not here. They could easily be hiding somewhere close. And the troops can spread out while foraging. Particularly now, they're going to be under a little bit more pressure with the drought, having to forage a little bit more intensely. You still see him, Andrew? No, he went behind the log. He went behind the log. Well, let's leave that little monkey to carry on with its morning of foraging. We're going to keep looping around, seeing if these, we can have another spot of that cheetah. Cow. There we are. Everyone was wondering what we were staring so intently into, into a tree about. I'm sure when they saw us doing that, they were like, oh, maybe there's a leopard, but not just a little monkey. going to go really slowly along here and I'm going to jump up onto the door so I can see a bit further into the bush and while we do that Mercedes is wondering how cold do our winters get do we get snow and what time of the year is winter for us so Mercedes I think the coldest in the Sabi Sands we ever get is around zero Celsius and that's thick something in Fahrenheit. Uh, we don't get snow down here. Uh, I don't think there's ever been snow down here. Well, not since the last major ice age, but I even think then we didn't get snow here. But uh, so the coldest it ever, ever gets is about zero degrees Celsius. 
but normally uh, in the height of winter between 5 and 10 even 15 degrees in the early morning is about the coldest we get and our winter starts in earnest the center of winter is june july so it will be the height of summer for the northern hemisphere and it isn't a very long winter it warms up quite quickly in towards the end of august september so i won't lie i'm a little jealous of scott this morning seeing that cheetah so we're just gonna have a quick slow look to see if we can find it uh, well chatting of scotty uh, he's got something else to show you so let's go see what it is look at all these zebra i'm sure the most a lot of you have ever seen in one place and it's causing quite a commotion they're kicking and letting off their strange call a few foals in and amongst them and interestingly enough that's just a portion of them they are more off into some thick bush it's probably not worth even let's try and show them quickly Dave off to the right in a few thick bushes there are a few more dotted around in there so I'm not sure how many are there the majority are at the water's edge though but they are creating quite a commotion and a fuss at the water's edge so let's take an eye on them there or we'll keep an eye on them there <clears throat> and I'm sure we're going to see them stamping about oh there's a kudu coming onto the scene but young foal needs to be careful and zebra can be quite vicious animals and stallions who are not the fathers of young foals will often attack them and kill them a horrible scene that james and vm saw not so long ago we arrived <clears throat> well it was quite a while like oh some warthogs are now arriving how cool is this um horrible scene james was out on tracking team look at all those pigs looks like two mothers possibly with their offspring but a possibility that one mother had six youngsters i'm not entirely convinced that that's possible but there are people that believe that i'm more inclined to think that they generally have four youngsters the piglets Anyway, as I was saying, probably about six months ago, James and VM, who were out on tracking team, came across a poor zebra foal that was being kicked right. to pieces by a few stallions. They stopped and continued chasing the females around, and obviously the stallion who was in charge of them, but the damage they had done proved to be fatal to that young foal. They had broken its leg. So let's hope that doesn't happen here, but in times of droughts, like this we can expect to see animals tempers flaring abnormally so kudu's trying to squeeze in here now interesting that she's come to the pub alone wild dog are not too far beyond the dam wall that you can see in the background there i'm not too sure how far exactly possibly about half a mile to three quarters of a mile further north of us they've managed to catch an anyala that they are feeding on and the problem is is that there is a water hole very close to where they've caught that anyala so i don't see why they would want to rush all the way over here for a drink when they can simply drink over there Sandy and Julia who, who oh sorry Andy thank you Dave um, Andy and Julia would like to know something quite strange you guys are thinking out of the box cowboy and cowboy boy <laughs> Andy and Julia would like to know if you can ride these beasts and yes you certainly can but they prefer a very small human to be on top of them, if possible. Their 
backs and bodies aren't quite strong enough to carry adult humans. This is what I'm told, of course. I've never attempted to ride a zebra myself. But there was actually a movie made called Racing Stripes here in South Africa where a young girl somehow ended up with a zebra that she was riding around and racing it in competitions eventually. Against all odds, I think the zebra did quite well. But the bottom line is there is a person riding the zebra. I've also seen... Oh, we need to rush you over to Brent. Look at this, guys. Right next to me. Little elephant. Completely relaxed in our presence. We actually stopped and it walked right up to us to come have a look at us. Nearly touching the front of the vehicle. One. And feeding off the acacia sprouting from the ground there. Look how close it is. It is incredible. No, little lady. Oh, bit of an argument behind between the eddies. He's feeding off that baby acacia exuvialis or flaky thorn. Wow, how's that elephant scream? I'm not sure if you can hear it with the audio we've got on this vehicle. Hello. Hello, miss. And you're a wonderful young lady. Now, there are a huge amount of elephants around at the moment with this very dry, dry. So, apparently, we've got a gremlin or two. Sorry about that. We're going to just jump back to Scotty and we'll be back with you as soon as we manage to fix it. Well, you'll notice about two million impala have joined the scene here. Sadly, most of them are actually slightly out of shot, and there's no way of us getting a better angle, but they literally came streaming in. Why are you gone? Running in with absolute joy to quench their thirsts. You can see the zebra kind of slowly filtering off, but some of them are still at it. A warthog, I think, are dotted in and around him somewhere there, but difficult to see. There's the kudu, she's got her spot, so it's all happening. One impala male, it appears, with all the females that have just arrived. He is on an ego trip, but it is of absolutely zero value because none of these females are in season. And if anything, I think other male impala will think of him as being quite a sissy for hanging out with all these ladies rather than being on the boys trip at the moment so don't be fooled by that one male impala he is not very important you can see those impala they're literally jumping for joy off goes the kudu now and what a beautiful scene this is here at the Sydney's water hole. It's the biggest source of water close to close to Juma at the moment. And a young impala in the foreground having a little toilet break there. The bigger older male coming in to test the scent given off by that male. And another male coming in. We'll probably do the same thing. And isn't it fascinating that they read so much into one another's pee and poop? Almost like we read into Facebook and WhatsApp and SMSs. That's a major form of communication. It looks like the guy's sending a message now. Yeah, busy sending an SMS. And will the final one add his two cents to this little chat group? Yeah, it looks like it. So, they're having a three-way chat at the moment. Wonderful. 
bless you, Dave. Appears like Dave may have swallowed a fly. He did. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. So right. that's what the little coughing gesture or sound was. You handled it very well, Dave. Good first fly. Thank you. First fly and first cheetah. Things are looking really good for Dave's future here at Safari Live. And we're going to continue on. Speaking of Dave and his future, we still need to find him a leopard, so that's what we're going to go and do now. And we're going to have to power down our vehicle in order to start it because it appears like the mobilizer has given in again or taken control of us. So we are stranded for now over to Brands. So we're still just sitting quietly in the middle of this herd of elephants. Um, some more have come uh, from the west of us and slowly making their way towards us. Beautiful big herd. Yes, hello mister. That is a little boy. You can see by his behavior in the road in front of us. Yes, not so brave. And look at this tiny little baby here. So cute. just slowly moving through the bush, feeding. Elephants on both sides of us, the ones behind us are in quite thick bush, these are in the open a bit more. Here comes a little one. Giving us a good sniff. So what I'm gonna do, try to get ahead of them so they can walk into us. So just bear with me while we move a little bit. No elephants behind us, Andrew. of you guys have said a barrel of monkeys for the colonial collective noun quiz and I'm afraid that is not right so you're gonna have to try again we forget how wonderful those little vehicles we drive in are when we have to drive a long one like this. Oh, hello. Hello, madam. It's okay. Little head shake there. But there are elephants everywhere and they are heading down towards quarantine clearings. So hopefully they'll be out in the open. Well, who knows, maybe they'll chase the cheetah out into the open for us. To this little grove of flaky bark caches. Oh, and if I just look around, there's elephants everywhere. Hello, little cheeky one. There's something incredibly special about, be about being surrounded by elephants. move through. Yeah, Mom and the little baby look like they might come past us quite close. So 
there's a big misconception that elephants have very bad eyesight. Uh, they don't have that bad an eyesight, so I'd say it's reasonable, but they do rely more on their hearing and their smell. So they're able to have lots of really good senses. Hello, Mom. Hello, but little one. A little bit nervous keeping mom between us and it. So we just have to keep quite still here. So it was James who asked the question on the eyesight. So they have reasonable eyesight, but having such incredible hearing and smell, they tend to rely on those other senses a bit more. Oh, there we go. Uh, there's a female elephant that Andrew likes to call Fang. And it's because she's got an inverted tusk. I'll try once we are able to move and we let these guys move past. Oh, let me, sorry, I just need to be on the radio. We'll go have a look. Okay, let's just keep still. They're very close. I don't want to move right now. Hello, Mom. Yeah, there's another big clumby um, between quarantine and Zoe's heading towards quarantine. Uh, if, I'm, if I did another loop around the block, I'll, I'll check again just now. So when a female elephant's nice and close to us like this, Andrew's going Picasso, free hand, so you can get a better view. So they're so lovely and relaxed with us that I don't want to move the car and maybe slightly upset them, so we'll just keep still and wait for the elephants to move off at their own speed. sitting so close to elephants and they are such incredibly large and powerful animals. Brenda in Virginia is wondering well if one charges us will the others join in? Sometimes especially with breeding herds that multiple cows might charge uh, but it doesn't it's not always a fact sometimes they will most of the time they won't and if you drive carefully and you read their behavior correctly and give them space when they need it uh, you shouldn't get charged. You might get a warning charge every now and then, or a little head shake, but uh, very seldom in my life have I experienced full charges while on a vehicle. Yes. Hello, it's here. Isn't that wonderful? And amazing how dexterous their trunks are. And she's eating a little sickle bush. So the monkey quiz continues and still no one has got it. It is quite an obscure one. 
So I'll give you a few more minutes before I give you the answer. Uh, there's been a few more in, a cartload or a tribe. And nope, those are not correct, unfortunately, Mary, who's in Texas, but really good try. There we go, Andrew getting artistic with you guys here, holding the camera low out of the vehicle to give you a slightly different perspective on this elephant cow. There she goes. So that's giving us enough space that we can happily move now. Uh, Marcel says, is it a parliament of monkeys? Uh, unfortunately not Marcel, but it, that is a colonial collective noun, but for owls, it's a parliament of owls. So let's go see if the elephant Andrew calls Fang is about. Interesting name for an elephant, Andrew, since they are not very... don't really eat too much meat. Although I suppose a tusk could... that tusk does look a little bit fang-like. There she is. Uh, Lois, Congress of Monkeys. Nope. Unfortunately not, Lois. Here we go. That's a really, really interesting fa uh, tusk. And obviously it's just a bit of a, a genetic anon anon anomaly. And even though it's facing the wrong direction, if we have a close look on the tip of that trunk, it is very much used. And we see that little notch in the trunk. And I wonder who can figure out what that notch is used for. What would possibly wear a tusk like that? What does an elephant eat that causes that notch in the, tr in the tusk? And if you do know, let me know. Pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. Very interesting little notch. So Kitty Cat in Seattle would like to know how fast would an elephant run? Well, Kitty Cat, they can get very quickly up to about 45 kilometers an hour. Here she comes. Isn't she beautiful? She's quite a big female, an old female. And you can see the indentations on her, on her head starting to show. Currently, she doesn't have a young baby, just judging from her mammary glands. She's munching on a buffalo thorn, one of the few evergreen trees we get out here. It's going to be very important for a lot of animals this year, the buffalo thorns. one coming up from the other side and Georgie in Australia is wondering is there any particular reason for female and male elephants to have different head shapes well the most obvious is that is that males tend to bash each other in the head uh, with their heads and that would be the most obvious reason that they have different head shapes so a male's skull is designed to take more of a pounding uh, when fighting with other males for mating rights with females. Now, I'm gonna guess 
throughout this, there's probably 70 or 80 elephants all spread out through the bush here. We can't see them all together. And there seems to be a few more coming from the north as well. So we're going to move around again, get ourselves into a good spot. When we do that, I've got a Virginia. Sorry? Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Oh, dear. Okay. So Virginia is wondering, would those notches ever wear completely through those little notches on an elephant tusk. It is possible, Virginia. Uh, as you can see, that one's worn, that we were looking at, is worn quite far through. I'm just going to go around these ellies, give them as much space as they need, and I'm hoping they are going to pop out into the vast open clearings of quarantine. And quarantine sounds like a very strange name for being out in the bush, but it is an area where cattle or cows were quarantined when they were attempting uh, to turn this area into farmland. Very unsuccessful attempt uh, when the lions eat the cows faster than they can breed, generally it lends to bad business. So there's elephants behind us there. And then I'm just going to try to show you how many elephants. So we've got lots of different answers, a bag, a mischief, uh, all of them are unfortunately incorrect. So I'm going to give you the answer. It is a shrewdness of monkeys is the old English colonial collective noun. As you can just see as we, oh yes, very upset, very scary. As we pan through, and these elephants continue even further on into the bush beyond. Ellie's, Ellie's everywhere. These eddies are going to keep moving through. I'm going to move on. I'm going to do one last check for that cheetah. And then I'm hoping by the time I come back to the elephants, they'll be nearly at the waterhole. And we could have some splish splashing and playing around. 